God sees us as we will be and not as we are. And in saying that, I say that, that God sees us through the eyes of an artist. If there's one thing that I have always been fascinated by, it's people with talent, right? Especially some talent I don't have. And if there is a talent I do not have, it is an artistic ability, right? I, I really don't have the capacity to draw that well. I remember a time uh, way back in school, I took an art class and I, I pretty much erased a hole through the paper when we were trying to do one simple thing, which was draw a human elbow. All right, I was supposed to do an arm and an elbow at a certain angle. And I just like, nah, that's not it. And then I'd do it, nah, that's not it. And the teacher came up beside me and just went, and it was perfect. I was, it, that's it, that was it, you know? And, and that's what she said. She said, it's, it's a little more like this, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I know. I, I, and then, you know, but mine looked like a, a, a just a, you know, angle. I just couldn't get it right there. And so when I think about that again, as somebody who can see something and that isn't yet there, but it's just there in their mind as it could be, and they can actually bring it to pass. See, and I think about that, that God sees us as we will be through the eyes of an artist, not as we are right now, but as we can be in his hands. And see, when I think about that, he loves us just the way we are. And that's a wonderful thought, just a peaceful thought to say, yeah, God likes me. He loves me just as I am, but he loves me too much to leave me the way he found me. He'll, he'll find me in a, in a condition and not say, nah, nothing to, nothing to see there. No, he sees the potential. He sees the things that will be down the road. And he wants to mold and shape us and chip and change us until we become a masterpiece. And so I titled today the talk that we're going to have here, The Master's Peace. The Masterpiece, but the Master's Peace, because the emphasis there on the master and on the peace that we are. Everyone here in this room, you're a piece of work, right? That's a, that's a vernacular that, that the kids use sometimes. Oh, that kid's a piece of work. What's it mean? Well, they're, they're a little special. They're a little different. They're a little, you know, atypical. But when you think about it, isn't everyone on some level? And so when you think about it, Ephesians 2.10 is a great passage. Many people consider it a life verse, you know, one of their favorites. But it says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. What does that mean? That we are a masterpiece of the master, right? We reflect his genius. And see, when you think about this, Workmanship, that word is an artistic word. It's actually what they would use in the Greek to describe a poem or a painting or a sculpture or a work of art. And I'm sure you're familiar with, with this statue here. Maybe you haven't seen the version uh, that I have here that we're just trying to keep it, you know, uh, PG at least for, for the here. Uh, but this is Michelangelo's statue of David, right? And I added my little touch there. Uh, but this is one of the most instantly recognizable works of art in the world. Again, when you think about it, the statue shows the young boy, David, as he faced Goliath. You know, this, this moment, this momentous event in his life. And armed only with a sling, five stones, and his faith in God, right? It's a, it's a biblical story, and yet here Michelangelo carves it into stone. And so it's one thing to see it in a picture like you're seeing it now. You know, it's kind of tiny there. Uh, but, but in fact, that statue stands 14 feet tall, okay? And, and on top of that, on a pedestal. So, I mean, it's just massive. It dominates this huge room. There's a single room where this is housed, and this is the only thing in that room. So you walk into that room, and it's like, Wow. It made me wonder, I, I wonder a lot of things when I see things in life, but my main thing was, where's the room where Goliath is? Uh, because that one, that one, whoa, that would be really huge. That must be another whole wing of the, of the museum. But I had the opportunity to see this statue in person when I visited Florence, Italy as a study abroad student in 1987. Can't believe it's been that far back. 
But when I think about that, even at the time, limited knowledge and appreciation of art, and in fact, one of the things that changed so much when I went on these trips and tours was my mind and my life expanded to have a more artistic eye, to have more of an appreciation for things that as a kid I would have said, yeah, whatever. And I really stood there as a student and it was funny, no teacher made me go to this museum. Isn't it funny how, you know, sometimes people make you learn, but then there comes this moment in your life maybe where you love to learn. And I was like, this is amazing. And I got the little tour and I got the book and I was start reading all of this stuff and just noticing the beauty and detail of this statue. I spent easily an hour in that room, just kind of all different angles and looking at it and thinking through it. And the veins in his hand are one of the things that they'll do detailed pictures in the art books on. But you forget that this was made out of stone. I mean, it, it looks so almost more real than real. I mean, it's, the detail is unbelievable. The muscle tension and, and things like that, you go like, how is this even possible that some artist could do that? The expression of calmness in his face and yet tension in all the muscles, it's really amazing. And so people will look at, even an amateur like myself, will look at that and say, the ability of this artist, <laughs> This is very, very difficult. The, the beauty of the finished product, but the process is what sort of fascinated me there as a student all those years ago. And the obstacles that I wouldn't have known that Michelangelo went through to, to create this masterpiece, that he had to overcome to do this, that was part of the genius with it. See, the block of, of marble that this came from the statue of David was sculpted from a single big block of marble, okay? A single big block. This wasn't like pasted together. It wasn't like, okay, he did a little piece here and then glued it together or any of that kind of stuff or, or uh, something like that. Historians tell us that Michelangelo searched the stone shops of Italy and found nothing that would be fitting his vision until he spotted this big block of marble in a reject room. There was actually a place where they dumped marble that wasn't really working out for them. So you had people who, who had maybe attempted something and then midway through the arm just fell off, you know, and you're like, nah, blah, and you dump it in this spot. Well, this is where Michelangelo actually found this. It was a beautiful block, but it had a serious flaw. See, other artists in the area, as the story goes, had rejected it because they knew it had potential, but they couldn't realize it. The, the flaw that was in it, there was a flaw that was in this huge block of marble, the only one they could find big enough to do what he wanted to do, but oh no, it has a flaw. And it had scars from failed attempts at other amateurs who'd come in and go, well, I'll try it. And so this thing not only had the inherent flaw in it, now it kind of been beat up by some other people and dumped into the pile. See, and you think about this, the shop owner, again, as the legend goes, tried to talk him out of it. Oh, you don't want that one, Michelangelo. You don't want that one. You see, it has this hole over here in it. It has things that other artists have, have tried and failed. What, you, you're, a, you're a good artist. Let's, let's show you our showroom here and, and take you to the other blocks of marble. And he said, Michelangelo insisted, this is the one I want. This is the one I want. This is the one I want. And he said, why do you want that one? And this quote has changed my life since I heard it. He said, because that is the one with David in it. That block of marble has David in it. Again, when you think about that, that's the eyes of an artist. Be able to see something and say, I must have this one because this is the one that has the thing that I'm going to release out of it. That's the one with David in it. Everyone else saw the flaw. Everyone else saw the scars. Michelangelo saw the finished project and product and the project that he could do to make that happen. He saw the block of marble with the eyes of an artist. And again, I remind you that thought, that simple thought, it takes a master to make a masterpiece because a master has to see the end before they begin, right? Now, when you think about that, very, very relevant to our own life in some way. And when you think about this in his hands, we can become the workmanship that God saw 
when he created us in Christ. He loves us just like we are, but he won't leave us that way. He still has something to do in your life. You know how I know? Because you're still here, right? One of the ways you can know, <laughs> is God through with me yet? No. And so somebody else may throw you away, but God is not through with you. And so look at the works of art that he has done. This is what we're doing in Mark. It's kind of looking through some other works of art that God has done in the past. See, it should give you, this is the connection with your life and my life today. It should go, if he could do that with them, he could do something with me. Because what we miss a lot of times is the obstacles God had to go through to get to the people that he worked through you know, these guys that we think and put in stained glass and put halos over their head and you go, wasn't really that way. These guys were projects, projects, projects. And yet God looked at them and said, that's the one with a disciple in it. <laughs> that's the one with a apostle in it. That's the one I want. So you look at Mark 1 verse 16, this is what it says. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And verse 17, Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And verse 18, they immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he'd gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the boat, mending their nets and immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and went after him so first of all we see two pieces of work all right uh, verse 16 Jesus saw Simon and he saw Andrew and then in verse 19 two more projects right we see James and we see John in verse 19 now, again, when you think about this, not all eyes that see, see the same thing. So you and I might have walked along the Sea of Galilee, right? Let me just take you there in your mind for just a moment. And you are seeing fishing businesses. This is what was just common stuff. Now, you know, again, to translate it into today, a lot of people would love to be in the fishing business, right? They're like, oh, that'd be great. I just go fishing for a living. But you got to remember, this was hard work and remains that today you know this was not a recreational thought you know that they went out on their boat and caught a few fish this was their life's work and you might compare it to any type of factory work or any type of just you know common regular old show up at work work hard make a little show up the next day get up early you know that cycle and when you think about it god sees every person with potential Every person with potential, with promise. Now, again, people might have walked by, you might have walked by, I might have walked by and just seen a couple of, couple of fishermen, brothers, I don't know. Nothing unusual, a uh, couple pairs of brothers, professional fishermen, very common. And Simon and Andrew were doing something that was just real normal, which was cleaning the net. This was everybody's worst part about it you would fish and fish and fish and then you had to clean up at the end i remember working at uh, many fast food restaurants and the worst part was closing we would some of the restaurants i've worked at you'd close at one or two in the morning and then closing you had to clean up after everything drain the fryer the grill all this stuff you get out in the middle of the night. Nobody loved doing this part. So this was the part of it where they're cleaning up the nets afterwards. This is what it says, that they were doing this. They had pulled in fish, and now they're getting ready for the next day. And maybe Jesus watched them for a while. We don't know. We don't know what all he saw, what flaws he saw. Maybe they had, you know, did they talk like apostles? I don't know. Were they super loving toward each other as brothers? Did they say all the right things and do all the right things while he was watching them? Probably not. I don't know for sure. But again, what Jesus says to these four is you will become fishers of men. Now that's strange sounding phrase right there probably sounded strange to them too. But basically he's saying you're going to fish for people rather than fish. I mean, fish are fish and people are people. 
And guess what? He says, I'm going to take what you're already doing and kind of mold and chip and shape it around to something that has not just value here, because there's nothing wrong with fishing for fish, but he says, I'm going to do something that lasts for all eternity. Not just building your business or whatever else, but I'm going to actually have you have an impact that is on human life, someone who catches people. For what purpose? Well, I like to think of this thought. I hope it's helpful to you as if you've ever done fishing. Uh, this is, is probably my favorite thing. It's catch and release. What is catch and release? You catch the fish so you can let the fish go. Um, and, and when you think about it, God catches people. Why does he want to catch them? So he can fry them up in a pan? No. <laughs> Catch and release. I mean, he wants to catch them and release them actually to their full potential. Why did Michelangelo want to pick that flawed marble up out of the reject room? To release it back into the reject room? No. To put it into a place of potential to where for all eternity, really, people look at that and marvel at the marble. And go like, how can this be that that was made out of that? See, and I think about this, to find your full potential, your full, full purpose. People with potential to have an eternal impact, think about this, on people who will have an eternal impact, on people who will have an eternal impact, on people who will have an eternal impact. Isn't that what it is? I mean, you think of these guys, and they were a long time ago. Something happened between them and us, right? What happened? Somebody got caught by somebody who got released by somebody to go be who they were, who had some impact on your life or my life for eternal things. See, I think of all the amazing people who have crossed my path. Once my path crossed the cross, right? I came in contact with Christ, but how? Because somebody was willing to share their faith either vocally or visibly or a combination of both to where I went, I want what you have. God did this in your life, I want that in my life. And see, when I think about that, that is how simple this process is. But again, it's the master who makes masterpieces. And you can take a disaster piece and make a masterpiece and people say they could praise the marble, right? I could go into that place and go, oh, this statue. Oh, statue, you're so amazing. Let me worship the statue. No, instead it was, wow, I got to find more out about Michelangelo. This guy must have been pretty amazing to do something like that. And see, this is the whole idea is that when God picks a person like Peter or Andrew or James or John, part of the purpose of him picking them is that people would look on and say, well, if he can do that with them, he might be able to do something with me. Exactly. See, just like Michelangelo picked a flawed piece of marble, made it a masterpiece, and now the emphasis is on the master. This is what was happening. He picked flawed men. We know a lot about Peter's problems. You know what his problem was, one of them? He had a tendency to talk first and think later, right? Think later, talk first. His was ready, fire, aim was his motto in life, right? On your mark, go, get set, right? He would just launch off all the time. That was, that was Simon. And Jesus gave him a new name. I think it's interesting. He says, well, I'm just going to rename you. And we just talked about that just a few minutes ago, that uh, one of the things Miffy likes to do in her class is give a Chinese name to her students, right? And she'll do it on the basis of a first impression or something. I was saying how dangerous it would be for me to find out what my Chinese name was. I don't really want to know. It's probably the guy who won't shut up or, you know, uh, whatever else, or big wind blowing or something like that in, in Chinese. But... But when you think about that, you go, I, I don't know if I want to know, but this is what he said to Simon. He said, Simon, Simon, you will be Peter. You know what Peter means? It means rock. He says, you will be stable, Peter. You will be somebody who has something that people can build on. People can look at that and say, there's a guy who's not blown by the wind. So you think about it. Simon was like a big blockhead. He really was. He was like a block of marble. He was hard-headed. He was proud. He was stubborn. But I want you to think about this for just a minute. There's an upside to your downside. I don't know if you know your downsides. I'll be happy to tell you what they are if you want to know. Um, but, you know, wow. find a friend. Everybody, honestly, people know our flaws even better than we do sometimes, right? 
But this is the thing I want you to think about today. It's not your downside, but there's an upside to your downside. Whatever it is, there's, a, there's an upside to it. See, I think about this. Peter was stubborn. Yes, he was. Peter was persevering, wasn't he? And you go, oh, he's so stubborn, that Peter. You're raising Peter in your house, and he's so stubborn. And you go, oh, man, he's so persevering. He put up with things that others would have given up on. And you go, oh, wow, there's, a, there's an upside to the downside. See, that's the artist's eye, isn't it? That's seeing people with the potential that Jesus sees them with, and that's what you and I are supposed to do. It, oh, Peter, he's so impulsive. Yes, he is. He's so creative. He's a guy who stepped into situations that others would have said, well, I don't know. if I, And Peter just jumps in and does it. Is that good? Yes. Is that bad? Yes. God's got to manage that, right? As a master, he's going to master that and actually mold and shape. See, I think about this Peter in Jesus' hand. Well, Peter's natural state was fisher of men. Sort of, right? It took the supernatural work. God didn't have to undo everything that Peter was. He had to just simply chisel away some things that Peter was. He had to take away some things that Peter was. But he didn't want to take away everything that Peter was because Peter was perfect in his imperfection for the call that God had on his life. And I love that thought. Really, really important. See, this is what he said, right? I will make you. Oh, man, I love this. Follow me and I'll make you. I will make you something if you follow me. Which means if you don't follow me, I guess you'll make you. Right? <laughs> I've thought about this so many times in my life, the alternate endings. I like it when you think about um, director's cuts and stuff. Sometimes on movies they have a different ending or they'll talk about how in the original script they weren't sure whether to have it go this way or that way and they filmed both. Have you ever heard those things where a favorite movie of yours, you're like, oh, I love the way this movie ends or I love this movie but I hate the way it ends. And they filmed an alternate ending. And you can actually watch it on the DVD and see the story go differently. And I thought, in all the possible alternate universes, what was Scott making Scott through his life? I don't know. I, there were some plot twists in my life, but the twist that came when Jesus said, follow me and I'll make something of your life. Man, I, I almost would love to watch the alternate and go like, Yuck. I mean, what was the alternate for these guys? They built a huge fishing business and that was it. Or, you know, one day one of them fell out of the boat and that was it. And wow. Hmm. No, you got Simon, do you think Simon's sorry that he followed Jesus and Jesus made him something? Well, it was a difficult thing. See, again, his natural state, there were some supernatural things that had to happen. He had chips and chisels, right? And I want you to think, as I'm thinking through this week, watch for the chisel that God gives in your life. There's things where you go, wait, I was using that. Um, you know, but the master goes, chunk, we don't need this. And you're like, I, I, I was using that, right? I mean, I want that. But there's an upside to your downside, and God doesn't want to change everything about you. He wants to bring out the upside of who you are. See, I think about that. Again, the rock that Peter was, it was kind of covered with a lot of problems. And the fisher of men, right? The book of Acts, you know it. Peter preached and 3,000 people responded. 3,000. I mean, I don't know if he ever caught 3,000 fish. That's a lot of fish. But he threw out the gospel net and into that 3,000 people said, yeah, I want what he has. Oh, I want that change. Many of them grew up with Peter and said, look, <laughs> if Jesus can do that with Peter, he can do that with me. And I like that thought. Same mouth that said so many stupid things. There's a, there's a great uh, set of scriptures. There's two times in scripture where it says, Peter, not knowing what to say, said, and he says something. I mean, it's amazing. The Bible says Peter had no idea what to say, so he opens it mouth. Right? And you go, he had no idea what to say. Maybe he had no idea what to say in Acts, but he said something in 3,000 people said, I want to get to know that God. See, when you think about that, that's Peter. What about James and John? They were so aggressive. You know what their nickname from Jesus was? Sons of Thunder. 
the Sons of Thunder. Now, most guys would love that nickname. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> Sons of Thunder, going to have shirts made. Um, you know, something like that. But the reason why, it was not really for the best of reasons that they were named that, right? What was Jesus going to make with them? Well, you would think they would be his bodyguards, right? But he didn't need that. When there was a city in Samaria, Samaria was an area in the century there where they lived where... Uh, People were mutts, right? What they would consider mutts. They didn't like people of mixed ethnicity and mixed background and everything. They're like not pure pedig pedigrees, right? They are in the reject pile. And Samaria was considered that way. The human reject pile is what they thought of. And James and John offered to pray for fire from heaven to burn up that city when they didn't immediately accept Jesus, right? They'd been rejected all their life, and they get an offer. Hey, God does care about you guys. And they go, eh, yeah, I'm not sure I want to hear that. And they said, James and John said, Jesus, we don't like people rejecting you. We'll call down and burn this place like Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, you guys don't really understand why I came, did you? You don't really get it. Um, <laughs> I'm not here to reject people who reject me. I'm not. I'm here to work on that reject pile until people start realizing I am looking at you with the eyes of the artist, right? Most people are not looking at you that way. Most people, it's one and done. Well, most people think God gives you one opportunity and if you don't take advantage of that in the first moment, then on to the next one. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm working on James and John right now. They think, oh, well, we're the ministers and they're the sinisters, right? And he says, no, you guys are my project right now. And someday, instead of sons of thunder, you might be the sons of light, <laughs> uh, where you're not looking to hit people with lightning, but you're looking to lighten the load of other people. You're looking to, they became known as the apostle of love. That's the John that's here, the apostle of love. Oh, he loved to call down fire, but God had to fire him a little bit through the kiln, right? take some things out of his life, purify some stuff out of him. He had prejudices galore. And so they needed tons of reshaping before they could even become part of the process. And that's what's happening in each one of our lives. See, I love the nicknames Jesus would give because I think he smiled sometimes when he said them. He's like, oh man, you guys are going to have to go through some storms, sons of thunder, to where you're wanting God to do the work in you rather than thinking you've going to burn everybody else you think of Andrew he's in this too we don't know a lot about Andrew and I love that I love that he's one of my favorite apostles because we don't know much about him he's what I call the other brother it, does anyone know about the other brother I was the brother right to my sister growing up my sister's a year a month and a day older than I am um, and in infinitely cooler all right. You have to understand how super popular she was in high school. I mean, beyond popular, more than you can imagine. And guys would talk to me, right? I got some overflow of the popularity. And some guy would come up and talk to me. A cool kid at school would come up and talk to me for about 10 minutes. And then he'd say, so, your sister, Karen, she dating anyone? I'm like, ah, you're talking, to, I'm not cool. You're trying to get to her through me. This is what it is. And I wish I could say it was, it was just that one experience, but it wasn't. My best friend, Steve. Oh man, super popular. He was a guitarist. I was a drummer. Uh, guitarists get the girls. It's just that simple. Um, and and, and uh, drummers, well, I don't know what they get. Um, but but someday, I, I stopped playing the drums and I got Lynn. I wasn't meaning that as that. I didn't mean that. I stopped playing the drums. I, I didn't mean it as a bad thing. In high school, man, I'm in trouble now. But girls would talk to me in high school for about 20 minutes. And then they'd say, your friend, 
the guitarist. Is he dating anyone? <laughs> and I go, uh, yeah, let me introduce you. You know, when I think about this, Andrew here, he wasn't one of the real superstars. He wasn't the person that everyone gravitated to first. See, every time we see Andrew, and we only see a few things from him, we don't see many quotes from him, we see a couple of interactions. And you know what he's doing? He's always bringing someone else to Jesus. In fact, he's the guy who brought Peter to Jesus. He's the guy who first said that that situation isn't described here in Mark, but it's described in another gospel. And you see that situation where actually it was Andrew who came first to Jesus, and he said, I should tell my brother Peter about this. And that example, actually, you, you look at everything that Peter did might not have ever been done if Andrew had not been that quiet kid who just talked to somebody he knew. See, Peter was a guy who would talk to anybody and everybody. And Andrew maybe only talked to people he felt really comfortable with. But St. Peter's Basilica in Rome might not even be there if not for Andrew. See, and I want you to notice this. Each of these people were very, very different from each other. And so uh, we have a teacher at the school, and one of, he's known for funny sayings. Uh, but he says, he'll tell kids, you're unique, just like everyone else. Um, you know, and it's, it, but it's true. <laughs> you are unique, just like everyone else. Everyone else is unique also. There, there's, there's not just like a, a you know, copy of everything. Jesus wasn't looking for clones. He was looking with the eyes of an artist. See, an artist loves originals. That's one of the things that's important when you think about it. Art originals are either price, priceless or worthless, right? If they're an original, they're worth something, and if they're just a cheap copy, that's what every amateur does, right, is, is a cheap copy of someone else and sign their own name to it. But Peter and Andrew and James and John, man, they are no, no two alike. Even James and John, you know, the sons of thunder who look so much alike, well, they didn't. And, and even though uh, maybe you've met people like this where they're like twins or something and people, oh, you're, you're, you're identical twins. Even identical twins aren't identical, right? In fact, one of the things they love to do after their parents have dressed them the same their whole life is shout out, I'm not that person right? I'm me. And, and they may go in completely different directions, looking very similar on the outside, but nothing alike on the inside. And so when you think about it, one of the questions I ask people all the time, if you want to know what God's made you or making you, is what makes you unique? You know, I, we were watching the, um, the Olympics, some of it yesterday, and there's a kid from Colorado named Red, right? And he just won the first gold medal for the United States in snowboarding. And man, this kid is a one of a kind. One of the thing about him, he's, he's pretty short, really. Um, and uh, he, he's, I don't know, he weighs like 12 pounds or something. But this guy, no, he's a little more than that. But he, 119, okay, but he, he's short little kid, pure muscle, just, you know, and, and just flies through the air like crazy. I mean, you know, he could have very easily, very unique personality. You can tell right away. I mean, his hair is just kind of like everywhere and stuff. And I'm like, this kid was born to do what he does, right? I mean, you look at that and you go, he could have said, oh, man, I want to be seven feet tall. I don't know any seven foot snowboarders. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe there's one out there, but this kid is so compact. He just flies and does what he does. So it's amazing how you see different people and you say, what makes you unique? And you go, well, I, I, nothing like that. I don't have anything like that. I've got to be really, really crazy and win a gold medal to be anything in life. And you go, really? The master makes all kinds of masterpieces. Follow me and I'll make you become. You can fill in the blank with whatever it is, but it, it's a uniqueness that God says, I, I would rather have you than a cheap substitute. See, when you think about this, there is not value in two of, of one. When God makes originals each time, Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and they kept doing <laughs> some of what they were doing. But what if they had just said, 
who is this guy, um, right? And Jesus had kept walking. I believe Jesus would have found four more down the road, right? He would have kept walking. He, he didn't force anybody ever to follow him, right? But he gave these guys a unique opportunity. But it might have been Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Fred. Um, if, 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 if maybe, you know, John had decided no, or, you know, the story of Reginald walking on the water, you know, instead of the story of Peter. Because it's like, Reggie, he'll do it, you know? But Jesus was going to teach and train some people for three years and tell them, now go spread the gospel, change the world. And again, I, I hope there's something in our hearts that doesn't want to miss out, right? Look where he goes to get his raw materials. Just a, a, a little cross the lake type of thing. He didn't go to the Jerusalem school for the talented and religiously gifted. He could have gone there, but you know what? Maybe they would say, I'm, I, I, no thanks. I don't need some second rate rabbi. I've got the best over here. So you think about this, he didn't go to the Roman palaces and look for the worldly leaders and say, okay, who's the rich and the famous already? Now that doesn't mean that God doesn't call from those places because he does. There are so many cool things in scripture, just little throw-ins, but there's times where it says like so-and-so from Caesar's household and you're like, wow, that, that, that's pretty high up there. You know, yeah, so he'll call all over the place, but the question is who will come when he calls? See, I wrote this down that the greatest ability is availability. Sometimes people go, oh, I don't have enough ability. Well, do you have availability? See, like Michelangelo, uh, that marble, if marble could have run away, it could have run away, uh, but it didn't run away. <laughs> you know. And so when you think about that, these four guys went after God. But one thing that's interesting is verse 18 and verse 20, it says immediately. I think you should know that they did follow him immediately in this moment, but this is not the first interaction they had with Jesus. I think it's really important to see that because sometimes you see this and you go, man, this is crazy, man. Like, like I got to quit my job if, if, right there? No, that's not the point. See, this looks like a very hasty decision. A mystery man walks along the shore, says, follow me. And these guys go, yeah, I don't want to watch this net anyway and go after him. But the truth is, there's about a year in the life of Jesus that had already been left out by Mark here. It's detailed in John chapter one through four. There was a lot of stuff that they'd already seen from afar. They had seen Jesus from afar. And he came to a point where he said, I would like to show you what I could do if you'll let me really do more in your life. I will make you, if you'll follow me, your uniqueness. I wanna bring that out. I wanna catch you and release you into everything that you would wanna do. Now, what's great about that is there are plenty of times in scripture where Jesus caught someone and released them right back to their hometown to do exactly what they were always doing, right? He, he says, go back and just be an example to people. Go back and keep doing what you're doing. Um, you know, sometimes people even say, I wanna quit and follow you. And he said, no, follow me and don't quit, <laughs> right? I, you're already exactly where you are supposed to be for a reason. There's a lot of those. And so this was an act of faith, not presumption. And there is a huge difference. Jesus had a specific purpose for them that would require them to go from town to town, right? He couldn't have his 12 disciples uh, based in one place because he was trying to spread grace among many places. So it required them to leave behind one thing to take hold of something else. But see, God, again, made no two people alike. We've talked in the uh, preamble to here today where it, we're about doppelgangers, which is a, a fancy word for your double, you know, that there's somebody else out there that looks kind of like you. And I am always scared when people do that. Um, you know, when they'll say like, this guy looks a lot like you, you should look him up online. You're like, uh-oh, um, this, could, this could be very humbling. Um, and you're like, oh, I, I don't know. But again, when I think about it, even on my trip to... Florence and throughout Italy and throughout Europe, really, there in every place, in every cool place, there's somebody trying to sell you a Mona Lisa, um, like at the, outside the Louvre. They're like, it's the the other one. There's two Mona Lisas, and one's inside, and this is the other original. And you're like, no, um, you know, are, are this this is an actual you know prototype of of. Di David, you know, and you're like, I, I don't know, it's 14 inches tall. I'm not, I'm not really sure that Michelangelo had anything to do with that one. But an original work of art, again, when you think about it, follow me and I'll make you. So don't ever confuse someone else's call with yours. I've seen people who come in and a missionary will talk and they almost have this idea that if you're not on their mission field of accomplishing their mission, then you're wrong and you're not following God fully. And if you would, you would leave your nets and you would go follow him and all this stuff. And you go, 
but that, that that's trying to make me a doppelganger of that person. I, I'm not that person. Now, if I'll follow with passion the way they followed with passion, God may have a very unique thing he wants to do in my life. So maybe you are here and you're you know, a teacher today, and that's exactly who you're supposed to be. And yet through that, God will use your life to catch people, and people will catch on to Christ because of you right where you are. It's not a geography thing. It's not a, a profession thing. That's not the point. The point is that the author has all the authority. So here's what I thought on verse 21. He says, they go into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. So Jesus goes into you know, their church environment, and they were astonished as teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Isn't this interesting? Because um, I wrote down again the thought, the author has authority. The master makes masterpieces. But what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus is teaching with authority in a place where you would have thought they would have got authoritative teaching each week, right? I mean, they're here in the synagogue, and in comes Jesus doing something that all the teachers are like, well, he's a good teacher. It's, a, it's like he's teaching it like he believes it. <laughs> he's teaching it like he wrote it. And, and I think about this, lips, you know, <laughs> preach it like you stole it. You know, lip syncing to the works of others. I've thought about that many times. You know, cover bands. You know what cover bands are? Cover bands are top 40 bands where they basically take whatever someone else's hit is and they learn it word for word, note for note, and they do a worse job of it. That's basically what it is, okay? So you're like, um, you see a, a band come to town and it's a tribute to or whatever, things like that. And guess what? You're like, mm, I don't know. They're just bad karaoke versions sometimes of other people's thoughts. And you see Jesus coming in here. He was, they were used to just this theoretical theology every week. It was like, wah, 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 didn't connect with their life. And Jesus comes in and says, I am the master. If I, you will let me master your life, you can have your potential come out. And they're like, wow, he's, he's, he's good. And I think about this. His teaching hit the heart somehow. It convinced and con convicted people. And he was not just talking about stuff. He was talking about the life-changing truths and the power to perform it and transformation. See, information... Nobody minds information. I could give you so much information on geography and geology and uh, this manuscript and that manuscript and people walk away exactly the same as they were before. Oh, the Bible's a great book. It hasn't changed my life, but I sure know a lot about it. And you go, you know what? I would prefer somebody just come in and say, this verse can change your universe, <laughs> right? And you go, wow, that's, that's good. That is good. See, Jesus here, he's a life changer. And, and, and the bottom line is the devil doesn't mind if you go to church as long as you don't change. Because it's not about church, it's about change. The, just this last week, I was talking with different kids about you know weekends. And I said, hey, did you go to church? And you go to church, anybody learn anything? And it's like, crickets, nobody went to church. I'm like, okay, Christian school, nobody going to church. That's cool. Uh, I'm like, but it's not about church, man. It's about change. Did anyone change this week? Did God do anything in your life no matter where you were? Uh, because, again, you can go to church in and out. That doesn't change the world. It's when people come out of church and change, that they change the world because they go be fishers of people like Jesus was talking about here. See, again, he came in here and they were all astounded that anyone was saying anything that mattered <laughs> in synagogue. Been a long time since that happened. And so the important point as you think about this, is the miracles are parables. See, parables are parables. Parables are miracles. I mean, when he told parable stories, they were intense. But he's about to go out of the synagogue and do some stuff. He did things in the synagogue and elsewhere where he did miracles. And each one of those had a message in them. And, and I told you last week that Mark, like no other book, records his miracles. Miracles, miracles, miracles. And you go, oh, if we could just see one today. Well, guess what? When you look at me, you are looking at one. Ask my wife. Um, this is a miracle of God's grace that I even go to church, much less <laughs> uh, you know, have anything to say about these things. She used to have to, I, I'd say I had a drug problem because I was drugged to church all the time. The only way I would get there is like duct tape me. I'd, I'd 
I would actually intentionally be rude to people. Lynn knows this. This is true. She would try to get me to go to a church for a special event, and I would be rude to people, so I would embarrass her, so she would never ask me to do it again. That was my attitude toward life. I would sit in the back and look through the uh, hymnal and make fun of funny names. Like there's somebody who wrote many hymns called Jesse Brown Pounds. That's actually one of the well-known um, writers, and I just found that very funny and <laughs> you know I would look for funny names and dorky things in and uh, that's what I did so there are miracles but think about this Michelangelo um, again this is conjecture but it's worth thinking about did you know that there's a lot of scientists who think that he was artistic because he was autistic See, they didn't do a lot of study back then or know all the science of some certain things, but they knew this guy is not normal. He's not typical. He's not average. And you go, okay, is that a disaster? Or is that something God can master? Because I think about this even when I work with youth all the time. You know, there was a student I was talking about this week, and he has... Uh, some diagnosed and diagnosable things, you know. And one of the things he said to me, I spent like an hour with him on a bench. We have a little park bench at the school, you know, and, and some things had gone on in the classroom. And I was like, these are the things outside the classroom that are better, right? When people ask us, what's your curriculum and different things like that, that's all great. But I spent an hour with a kid on a bench and I learned from him and he learned from me. This is a kid who can tell you any geographic thing anywhere in the world. You ask him what's the capital of whatever, he knows it's Austin in Texas, it's not Dallas. And that's an, that's an easy one. But there are, I, I'm talking any obscure thing anywhere. He can tell you where it is, he can tell you the population, he can tell you every Super Bowl, who won it, what the score was, what the score at halftime was, uh, everything else. Incredible abilities, but he also has some disabilities. And he told me, they can't cure me. I said, good, good. I'm glad they can't cure you, man, because if you weren't this, you wouldn't be that. I said, I, I understand we're trying to help you manage you know, the average world a little bit better, but you are no average person. You are way above average. You have capacities I don't even begin to understand. Why would we cure that? There's, it's, we don't want to cure it. We want to see what you could do in the hands of the master. What could God do with somebody who has that kind of capacities? What could he do maybe in some other kids when they learn to treat a kid who's different than they are instead of treating them badly, going, teach me how you do these things. How do you do this? Let me learn from you. See, I think about this. Jesus came to do more than fix physical flaws. He fixed physical flaws, but he came to set people free. He came to catch and release, catch and release, catch and release, to teach us to think maybe a little bit different, to see with the eyes of an artist. And there are two kinds of flaws. There are those that are sin, and there are those that are not. Sin needs to be cured. Sin needs to be dealt with. But not everything that makes you different or makes things difficult is something that needs to be fixed. See, I think a lot of times we have a fix-it attitude. Um, and, and it's like, as long as it can be that physical thing, well, let's fix it. Let's change it. Let's bring everyone back to average, you know? If a flaw gets in the way of God's work, then he's probably going to chip and chisel it out. But if a flaw is part of the work that God wants to do in your life, guess what he might do? He might just leave it in and work around it. He might. There's no power that can keep God from doing what he wants to do in your life spiritually, but sometimes he'll leave something physically. Now, you see this again, the, the miracles are parables. He's teaching something through this. Verse 23, it says, there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. And this is what he said. Let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. The Holy One of God. You know, I don't know what you think demon voices sound like. But Jesus rebuked him and said, be quiet and come out of him. <laughs> I love Jesus. It's so mellow. And verse 26, then the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice. He came out of him. And verse 27 says, they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? <laughs> this is, what new doctrine is this? 
with what authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout the region in, among Galilee. Yeah, you think? Um, one of the things that you see in here is that a person can only have one master, right? And, and I mentioned to you that, you know, it's, it's not about church, it's about change. And this guy, I don't know if it was his first day in synagogue or not, but this guy had been in the condition he was in, in synagogue, and again, they said, this never happened till Jesus walked in. And I think the reason is, so often when you see Jesus walk into a situation, it forces a change of ownership. I mean, it really does. It's going to change the question or force the question, who's the master? Because Jesus is not going to let someone be mastered by him and by everything else. It's a, it, it's a one owner issue. See, this man got a new master this day. And that's the issue that was going on right here. Because again, he had heard truths. People had said things, but never confronted the issue of who's going to lead this life? And when you think about this, Jesus says it so well, be quiet. It's really too soft a translation. If you look at the original language when you get home, you'll see it actually says, be muzzled. That's what it, it literally means. It's put a, a rabid dog and you just like wind duct tape around his face and say, ah, oh, shut up. Um, that's what he was saying. Get out. <laughs> shut up and get out. And the, the demon shakes the man, you know, it would have been quite a, a scene to see. But the gospel writers record all kinds of specifics in these things. But Mark just kind of says, you know, there it is. Jesus taught with authority like no one else had. And he says, what do you have to do with us? I know who you are. And I think this is so fascinating because this guy would think, I already have a master, I'm a disaster, and I have nothing to do with you, and you have nothing to do with me. And Jesus says, I have everything to do with you. I would love to start from the bottom and work up. I would love to use this example, because again, next week in synagogue, there were a lot of people who weren't demon-possessed, right? This is a rare event. This is not everybody. This is not, but it's a, it's a poster child, isn't it? I mean, from that moment on, next week, someone doesn't really have a lot of excuses for, well, why can't Jesus work with you? Well, because I'm not that educated. You go, well, that's interesting. Did you see what happened last week? That guy was like convulsing on the floor and God, now he's sitting over there and he's in charge of children's ministry or something. You go like, wow, that's, that's pretty whack. You know, maybe a little more time in between those two, but you understand what he's saying. As soon as they'd come out of the synagogue, look at verse 29. They entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So he's got the four that he's working on, his project. And Simon's wife, mother, incidentally, Peter did have a wife. It says it right there. Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. See, this is an amazing thought right here because this is Peter's mother-in-law, right? And I've got one of my mother-in-laws right here in this room. Uh, but when I think about this, the, you have a person who's sick, right? Just sick. They go over to the house, right? And Jesus heals her. And what he did was supernatural, but what she did was natural, just kind of natural. She serves him. She's like, oh, uh, you know, party platter? Um, anybody for some uh, milk, juice, water, what do you need? She just serves them. And it's a perfect picture for me because it's like he healed her and she wrote a book about her experience and she went on the speaking circuit and she led thousands to Christ. No, it says she served them. She just made a meal. And I love that because God prepared in advance things for us, but some of the things he prepared in advance for us is just humble service for others that may not even get noticed by others and might not even be thought as supernatural. But if he hadn't healed her, she wouldn't have been able to even do what she did. And so I love this because verse 32, you see how this chapter concludes. It says, that evening when sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and he cast out many demons. And they didn't allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Why didn't he want them talking? Because 
he didn't want a PR agent that wasn't ultimately him. Not all, not all news is good news. And not all advanced press of Jesus really does Jesus' work. I think a lot of times he has to keep a pretty low profile to be able to do what he really does because he came for individuals. I think this is so, so important because he came for individuals. He came for individual situations and there are masses of people, but Jesus didn't come really to deal with masses in, in mass. He, he, so many times he would have an individual situation because that's what artists do, right? They don't just mass produce things. And so he's like, let me be the first person to touch this person. Don't, I don't want a bunch of people talking about how I am and what I am. And, and look at this, this is so good in the morning. Having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed in a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and when they found him, they said to him, everyone's looking for you, <laughs> right? I mean, they now think they're part of his team, and they're going to tell the master how to do it. And verse 38, he says to him, let's go to the next town. I'll preach there also, because for this purpose, I've come. Isn't this amazing? Because there were lines forming, and, you know, the... Peter, Andrew, James, and John, we know that they were interested in positions. The Bible talks about it many times. They confess it. They're basically like, yeah, we thought we were going to be like the VIP vice prison, uh, you know, vice Jesus and the assistant Messiah and all this stuff. And they had a lot to learn. And the real reason he came is he said, I didn't come to draw a crowd. I came to have my hand on individual lives. See, and I love this so much, again, when you, when, you can, when you can trust God's hand because you, you, you trust his heart. There's times in my life where, frankly, I don't know what he's doing. And I don't know why he's doing that. <laughs> and there's people I look at and I say, well, I don't know why he's doing that. That seems like the wrong move on that person. I, I think this all the time, but remember, he's the master, right? And judging a work of art while it's in progress is a terrible idea, right? So I'm a project. You're a project. I am not yet a product. He sees me as I will be, not as I am. So I look at me and I go, well, I'm probably about finished, right? And have you ever seen one of those artist things where the, you think they're almost done and then they like just wipe the canvas and do all kinds of stuff and you're like... Uh, uh, wait, you know, don't get rid of that. And this is exactly what you see him doing, doing incredible stuff, but he's doing things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the rest of these guys, Andrew, and these people will see while he's doing stuff in other people's lives. And look at verse 39. I think it's important. He says he's preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. Incidentally, if you ever hear somebody equate demons and disease, they're not the same. In these verses just before, it said he cast out demons and he healed disease. They're different. Okay, God knows the difference. And so when you think about that, there are people who think every Thing that happens is the demon of this or the demon of that. That is not scriptural. And so a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down and saying to him, verse 40, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing, be cleansed. Now again, when you think about this, you see the, the artist's prerogative. What is that? The, the guy's basically saying, if, if you're willing, I, I know you're able. The question is, are you willing? And when I think about this, God's will is one of those difficult things to figure out sometimes. Because again, I think God should fix me, right? If there's something wrong physically, he should fix it. If there's something wrong financially, he should fix it. If there's something wrong you know, emotionally, it should be cured and all that sort of stuff. And you go, it's not that simple, right? Because all of those things, the main thing God is interested in, he's a spiritual artist. He's a soul artist. He is creating and recreating souls, right? He's taking the internal. So this leprosy situation, would he fix every leper that ever was? Look around at our world. There are people who have diseases that don't go away during their life. Does that mean Jesus isn't working anymore? He doesn't care anymore? No, he does fix physical things. Maybe you have your stories. I certainly have mine of what we've seen. But, you know, miracles are parables. They are things that happened in certain ex examples, and they were even rare in his day. So they, they didn't go, oh, miracles, we're used to those. These, these were happening, and they thought it was strange even in those days. 
And so a man with leprosy, he says, okay, he, he cleanses him and he says, don't, don't say anyone to anyone except the priest. Why is he wanting to go to the priest? That priest had books full of stuff to do when lepers were cleansed and he'd never gotten to open that book because there's nowhere that you see in the Old Testament that a leper got healed. You're like, wait, <laughs> yeah, it was all theory to him. He says, go tell that guy, go tell him, show him. He knows you used to be a leper. Show him there's something more than just what he knows. And it says the guy went out and he couldn't keep his mouth shut. He proclaims, proclaims it freely. And guess what? Jesus could no longer openly go from city to city. He had to go out into the desert and people still came out to see him. Okay, so I close it up there. This is an illustration you're going to love. Did you know one of the other things that Michelangelo did that's less known, but it was in one of the side rooms when I was there. It's something called the captives. It's something called the captives. And it was things that obviously are not as finished as David, right? Not as famous as David. But what they were is this whole set of figures, they're all like tortured and it looks like they're trying to get out of the marble that they're trapped in. And many artists consider this to be some of his greatest work. Again, lesser known than maybe the finished work that, I'm, oh, I can see that's really great. But going in and seeing these, fascinating, fascinating. And there's people who debate to this day because he didn't really say, was he not finished? Did he abandon them? They were too hard. What was he doing? Or was he trying to make a statement with it? Well, that's the wonderful thing about art. Who knows what he was trying to say? But I know what it said to me which is that Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to anoint me to preach good tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. See, I think Jesus looked at me and saw that with the eyes of an artist and said, that's the one with Scott in him. I just, I, I just, there's some things that are holding him back from what he would, be and someone might look at me and say not famous not impressive not finished you go all true but that's the eyes again of an artist that he can say but that's what he wanted to do with me this is what he wanted to do with my life what does he want to do with yours what does he want to do with yours well i know one thing he doesn't want to do he doesn't want you to feel unfinished captive and unable to really walk into that thing that god has for you and so when I think about it, again, if, it, if you walk out of here with no other thought, it's that God sees us as we will be and not as we are. We tend to see ourselves as we are. <laughs> you know, maybe realistically, eh, I'm not much. But he says, follow me and I will make you. Follow me and I will make you. Follow me and I will make you. The follow me is my part. The make you is his part. I can do that part, but I can't make anything out of my life. I can't make anything out of your life. But I can say, follow him is not a regret that I have. That's not a regret I have. Like, oh man, I never should have put my hands into the hands of the master. <laughs> I should have stayed my own master. I don't know anyone who's ever really followed him and said that. So God, I thank you that you can do anything with anyone. Uh, you reserve the right as the uh, artist to do something that's pleasing in your eyes, even if it's not as pleasing in even the person's eyes. I think about how the scriptures say we are the clay and you are the potter and the clay doesn't argue with the potter. And so I pray that we would, uh, if we have in any way gotten annoyed at the chisel or thought, uh, why don't you cure this or why don't you fix that, uh, that we would for just a moment, be able to see ourselves and others through your eyes and have maybe a wider angle view to what you're doing. And that Mark would be helpful for that. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they came to you and didn't regret it. Pray that we would continually come and follow in their footsteps for the unique life you have for us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well.